Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felder. Okay, it's good to see everybody in this afternoon, and for those of you joining us on television, again, we want to thank you for joining us. We uh, have just come back from a rather long trip, and you know, the thing that just rings in our ears when we get home is the word every. Every. They all say the same thing, watch you every morning. Well, you know, we love to hear that. And the couple right here just told the same thing, because uh, that tells us that there's a hunger. And uh, you're not watching it just to kill a half an hour from time to time, but to really get hooked on the Word of God. And uh, as one of my listeners I was talking to last night said, I never had an interest in this before, but now I just can't get enough. Well, that's as it should be. You know, just as soon as that new baby is born and it starts crying, what triggers the cry? Hunger. I mean, they want to be fed. And uh, that's the way it should be with the new believers. So those of you out in television, again, we just thank you for your response. We thank you for your kind letters and uh, your financial help and everything that makes this possible. All right, we're going to start a new book today. It's book number 78. And uh, we've finished our review of Genesis to Revelation in the last taping. So I'm going to be looking at something new today. And we're going to look at the many times in Scripture that Jesus Christ is referred to as the rock or the stone. And uh, there's a lot of confusion of that simply because of one verse. And uh, the studio audience already has it. So those of you in television, go with us to Matthew chapter 16. And uh, we're going to drop in at verse 13. These are verses we've used many times, but we're going to comment when we get down to verse 17. All right, jumping in at Matthew 16, verse 13. So when Jesus came into the borders of Caesarea Philippi, up there in northern Israel, he asked his disciples, the twelve, and he said, Whom do men say that I the Son of Man am? And they said, Some say you're John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said unto them, Whom say you that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father who is in heaven. Which, of course, is the normal way of enlightening people. Peter isn't the first nor the last. Now here it comes. Verse 18. Jesus said, And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And remember the word is always ecclesia, so it was a called out assembly, not necessarily the body of Christ church, but it would be a Jewish called out assembly, and the gates of hell shall now prevail against it. Now, I spent quite a little time, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I went into some of my Greek dictionaries, and uh, I just didn't find anything that I hadn't heard before, and that there's a play on words here. They're both pretty much the same, the rock or stone, and uh, one of the Hebrew words of the Greek is Cephas, from which we get Peter's other name, which is the word for rock or stone. The only difference is that when he says, Thou art Peter, the stone, it's in the feminine, if I got it right. But when he speaks of the other upon this rock, then it's masculine. And uh, so then I went to a couple of the other commentaries, and they both maintain that, yes, indeed, he was speaking to Peter as the little stone, but upon himself, the rock, he would build his church. And then I was really shocked when I got into Augustine. And you know, I've been rather critical of Augustine because after all, he became the father of Roman Catholicism. And yet even Augustine maintained that the rock on which Christ was speaking was himself. Not Peter, but rock himself. Now, of course, we're all aware that Roman Catholicism stresses the fact that that's why Peter became the first pope, because of this statement right here. But the Roman Catholics aren't alone. There are a lot of other Protestant groups that adhere to the same thing, that when Jesus said upon this rock, he was speaking of Peter, 
And I'm going to show, hopefully, from Scripture, contrary to the tradition of Christendom, that the rock in Scripture is always Jesus Christ. He is the rock. He is the stone. And uh, we're going to chase them down and uh, see if we make sense. Now, before we go back and look up our Old Testament reference to that, I want you to go ahead with me to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. And I think it's either verse 3 or 4. Verse 4. <clears throat> and this is the basis for our study today. We're going to go back to the Old Testament. We're going to look at these terms concerning Christ as the rock or the stone because Paul writes and tells us, for whatsoever thing, I know some of you are still looking, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 15, verse 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime, in other words, back in the Old Testament, they were written for our learning. And you know, I'm always stressing, there's a big difference between learning and doctrine. Doctrine is that which influences our behavior. Doctrine is what brings us to salvation. But learning is just simply background, see? And so all these Old Testament scriptures are not so much for background as they are for our learning, that we get a good understanding of how God has worked from the very onset of the human experience. All right, so reading on. That all these things were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Now, we're going to go back to Exodus, and as you turn back to Exodus, I want you to be thinking of one or two instances in the Old Testament where that is so apropos. Well, the first one that always comes to my mind is Joseph. Now, there was Joseph, the favored son, hated by the brethren, and because of their hatred, they sold him into slavery, and where did he end up? Down in Egypt. And as another uh, unfortunate situation in the house of uh, Potiphar when she accused Joseph of trying to assault her and he was consequently thrown into prison and if I've got my timing right the poor guy must have been in prison about 10 years did God ever give up on him did God forget about him why no and so it tells us no matter how tough things may get, no matter how deep the valley we're going through, God is there. And in his own time, he's going to bring us out of it, even as he did Joseph. Well, I think that's what Paul refers to then, that we study and uh, learn from these Old Testament scriptures, that we too may have the patience to wait on God, knowing that in his own time, he's going to bring us through to the fruition of everything. All right, now one of the first instances in Scripture where we have Christ as the rock is here in Exodus chapter 17. Exodus 17. And of course, Israel now is out there on the desert. Not a very pleasant place to be in the Middle East. And uh, how much of our everyday resources are on the desert. None. They're nothing. You know, the best time I can picture the desert is any of you went with us when we went down to Petra. And uh, from Oman all the way down to Petra, it was an all-day drive in that bus, and it's just nothing but flat gravel. And uh, nothing, even for an animal to eat. There were a few camels out there. I don't know whether they're eating rocks or what. But that was the perfect picture of the desert. There's nothing. Well, that's where these Israelites are. They're out there on the desert. And you know, it just happened that Iris was going through some of her stuff yesterday, and she came up with a little internet article that somebody sent me several years ago, and I'm sure you've all seen it, where someone in our uh, American army took the time one day to put the logistics that were necessary for Israel out there on the desert. And I'm sure most of you have read it and seen it. And they were looking at the same figure that I have used over the years, that three 
million people. Because I remember the first time I taught this, I used Dallas-Fort Worth as an example. Because in the 1990 census, if I remember right, Dallas-Fort Worth were a little over three million people. And so I used the example. Can you imagine Dallas and Fort Worth just moving out en masse and then ending up out there on the desert with nothing of natural provision? They were totally dependent on God. Totally. But they were human, and so what did they do? They griped, and they complained, see? And uh, sometimes it got worse than others. And Moses would say what? God, these are not my people. I didn't conceive them. You can have them. And God says, no, they're not mine. You're yours. <laughs> but nevertheless, get the picture. The poor people were out there on that flat desert living in their tents, I don't imagine they even had the wherewithal for a pickup basketball game or a softball game. So what did the poor people do for diversion, see? And that's why things got pretty difficult. But nevertheless, here the nation of Israel is out there completely dependent on their God. Now what are we to learn from that? Well, that's where we are. We are. We are totally dependent. We can't do anything on our own. Because as soon as a believer thinks he can do it on his own, he's in trouble, see? And so here's one of the lessons that we learn from this, that as Israel was totally dependent on their miracle working God, so we have to be dependent day by day. And uh, now when I say miracle working, as I was, you know, going over all this the last almost few weeks, has there ever been... Has there ever been a greater miracle than God moving a nation of three, and I usually put three to five, moving three to five million people out of Egypt, across the Red Sea, and out onto the desert, and taking care of them for 40 years? What a miracle! I was going to put that little article in the flyleaf of my Bible this morning, I forgot. But anyway, how many millions of gallons of water it took every day just for their routine use, cooking and bathing and what have you. And the carloads of wood that it would take for their fires. And we know they cooked the manna, they fried it, they boiled it and everything, so they had to have fires. And so this article just went through all the humongous amount of material that those three million people needed, not just for a day or two, not just for a week of camp out, but for 40 years. And yet God provided. Well, all right, that building brings us all the way up then to Exodus 17. And uh, again, I'm just going to start at verse 1 because uh, we've uh, we got plenty of time. Verse 1, And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord. See, this is all under the Lord's direction, day by day. And they pitched in Rephidim, and there was no water. Wherefore, the people did chide, or began to complain to Moses, and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, Why chide with me? Wherefore do you test the Lord? Well, I don't know what Moses expected them to do. You sure don't get water on the desert. So verse 3. So the people thirsted. There was no water. And the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst. Now that's the other thing I think a lot of time we forget. They didn't just move out with humanity, but they had all their livestock. And it must have been tremendous numbers of it. Everything had to eat and drink. Now what I'm building on is the miraculousness of it all and how God constantly supplied their need. All right, now just to show you how they complained, I think it's in Numbers 11. Turn up there with me, I'll find it. Yeah, Numbers 11. Jump down to verse 4. 
Now this was the attitude of these Israelites, I imagine, during the whole 40 years out there on that sandy desert. Numbers 11, verse 4. And the mixed multitude that was among them. Now that was probably non-Israelites, maybe a few of the Egyptians, we don't know. But there was a mixed multitude among them that fell a lusting, and the children of Israel also wept. And again they said, who shall give us flesh to eat? Well, what have they been eating? Manna, the provided food. But they were getting sick and tired of manna. They cooked it, they boiled it, they fried it, they baked it, and it was still manna. All right, so now they want flesh. And so, who shall give us flesh to eat? Now look at verse 5. Now, all we think of of these Israelites is they had been in absolute slavery. And slavery, we know, is never a very pleasant experience. That meant from the time the sun came up in the morning until set at night, they were under the slave masters. But on the other hand, it wasn't all bad. Could look at the next verse. We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions. Isn't that amazing? And you know what? That's the favorite dye of a Jew today. My, our breakfast over there, we go to Israel, that's what it is. It's cucumbers and fish and you name it. It, it hasn't changed. So you see, we don't want to we don't want to blot out certain parts of these things and be overcome by this. So along with their slavery and the horrors of it, they still had the good things. They were willing to eat, and they had their fish and their vegetables, and they had plenty of water. They were up there in the richest area of Eden. Now, you want to remember, Goshen was the most productive agriculturally part of Egypt. So we know that this is not just so many empty words. They, they had the wherewithal to produce a lot of food, see? All right, so now then, as they're out there on the desert, I think we can appreciate the fact that they were reminiscing. My goodness, back in Egypt, even though we did work all day, at least we could sit down and have a meal when we got home at night. We were always with plenty of water to drink, and here we are, nothing to eat except this manna, and nothing to drink. There's no water. Okay, now let's move on. So verse 4, Moses again cried unto the Lord. He said, what shall I do to this people? They be almost ready to stone me. Verse 5, and the Lord said unto Moses, go on before the people. Take with thee of the elders of Israel and thy rod. Now remember, that's been an important thing from day one with Moses going back to Egypt, was that shepherd's rod. All right, and he says, be sure you take your rod. Wherewith thou smotest the river, back there when he was still in Egypt, and he could smote the mile and uh, all the things that would happen when he would use that shepherd's rod. All right, so he says, take your rod, wherewith thou smotest the river, take it in thy hand, and go. Verse 6, Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock, there's your word, I will stand there before thee upon the rock in Horeb, now remember that's just the other name for Mount Sinai, and there shall come water, well, I missed the part, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the name of the place Massah and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel, and because they tempted or tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us? All right, now, it doesn't say it here, but in another account we have, what came out, a dribble or a river? A river, a river of water coming out there on the blank desert out of this rock, which was sufficient for these millions of Israelites, plus all their livestock. And what does that tell us? God provided all their need. 
Well, what's the lesson for us? Well, we're going to see it more distinctly when we get back up into Matthew when the woman at the well said, well, give me of this water. Well, what was Jesus talking about? The water of life, see? And this was a picture of it. This was merely a symbolic picture of what Christ would be to his own of any period of time. All right, and so out came this river of water that they were all satisfied. Now, the next verse is the next step after salvation for us, even today. Things never change. Verse 8, and then came Amalek. Well, Amalek, you remember, was one of the sons or the grandsons of Esau. They were arch enemies of the Jews. They were their constant torment. So when these tribes of these Amalites, Amalekites rather, when they saw this river of water out there in the desert, what do you suppose they did? Well, hey, they're going to come and take their part, see? And as they did, of course, it caused a fight. And so we have a war between these Israelites now and the Amalekites. But what's the spiritual lesson? Well, it's the same way in the spiritual. Just as soon as we feast on salvation, what's the first thing that comes in? Opposition from the devil in the evil part of the world. They taunt and they torment, see? And so here's the lesson. But when you go on, of course, then we see that Israel prevailed. But anyway, here is a perfect illustration. And now we're going to go back to the New Testament for confirmation. Come back again now up to 1 Corinthians and see what Paul says concerning this rock out there on the desert. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And see, this is where we learn when you compare Scripture with Scripture. Otherwise, you would never stop to think that just because Moses struck that rock that it was something special, but it was. And I'm going to let the Scripture tell you rather than myself. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and we'll start at verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren... I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers, in other words, all those Israelites that had come out of Egypt, three to five million of them, they were all under the cloud. In other words, it was their shade for that desert heat during the day, and it became a pillar of fire at night that protected them as well as gave them uh, the light that they needed. All right, and so they were all placed under that cloud. They all passed through the sea, the uh, Red Sea experience. They were all baptized, not the water baptism that Christendom thinks of, but they were placed by an act of God under Moses, or under Moses, or into Moses, however you want to put it. They were all placed into Moses and the cloud and in the sea as they came through. They were under God's protective care. They did all eat the same spiritual food, the manna. And then the experience that we just covered, they did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And now here it is. And that rock was who? Christ. Now you see, that's hard for our feeble little human mind to comprehend. That piece of rock out there on the desert, over there on the other side of the Red Sea, that was Christ. That's what the book says. And what did Moses do? He smote it. Well, what was the smiting a picture of? The cross. When Christ was smitten for mankind, what did he become? He became that river of life-giving water. See? And all the pictures and the symbolisms fit. Everything from Genesis to Revelation fits. And so here we have it as clear as language can make it. When Moses struck that rock with his rod, he was smiting the Christ of eternity and out came the water see and so here is another perfect example how that Christ is the all-sufficient rock 
He is the one that gives eternal life. He supplies all the needs of not only Israel, but the whole human race. And it's just a beautiful picture of symbolism again, how that all these things are teaching us and preparing the nation of Israel. Now, the point I want to make before we go any further is that uh, Israel is the primary recipient of the work and the miraculousness of the rock. Now, we're going to come later this afternoon to when Paul speaks of the uh, foundation of the church, but it won't be a rock. It's just going to be a foundation. But for Israel, all these references to the rock as being Jesus Christ were predominantly between God and Israel. Now, maybe I can make one point on that. Turn ahead with me a little bit to 1 Peter. 1 Peter. Oh, chapter 2. I'm going to come to it again a little later. But for now, just turn to 1 Peter chapter 2 and see how this is such an affinity between God and Israel is this role of the rock and the stone. 1 Peter chapter 2, dropping all the way down for verse 8. And a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, even to them who stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But now verse 9. Here's where I really want to come in. But you, these Jews, to whom Peter is writing. And remember, Peter is writing to Jews. He's writing to those who are scattered. All right, he says, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy or set-apart nation. See, now none of that applies to the church like most people like to think. This is Jewish language. They are the chosen nation. They are the favored ones. They're the peculiar people. They are the priestly nation, see? All right, and that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Well, yes, in a degree that applies to us as believers, but this is all primarily God dealing with his chosen people. They were the ones who were the holy priesthood. Remember way back in Exodus, we use it over and over. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. Well, you see, the scripture never tells you and I that that's our lot, but Christendom tries to tell us that that's what it is. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552 or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.